This is Cthonia, the world of the dark feminine. And welcome to Cthonia, the podcast dealing with the dark feminine. My name's Breach Burke, and today we are going to talk about Hera, who is the queen of the gods in Greek mythology. Uh, she's also known as Juno, um, which is her, you know, Juno and Jupiter, who are the, the same as Zeus and Hera in the uh, Roman version of the mythology, uh, although sometimes you will see Jupiter referred to as Jove. She is... Uh, okay, so she is the queen of the gods. She represents, um, you know, marital duty, uh, the, the, all the traditional trappings that are associated with marriage, and of what you might call "quote unquote" respectable women. So you may ask why a figure like Hera would be discussed on a podcast of the dark feminine. Well, as you might imagine, or if you've read any of the mythology of Hera slash Juno, you know that she is. Um, you know, there's she. She's actually a, a very dark figure in many ways, even though she is the the queen of the gods, the wife of the king of the gods. So there's a few things I want to cover today, because Hera. There are many many stories about Hera. There is no way I'm going to be able to cover all of them. So I'm going to stick to you know three or four basic themes here. Um, First, I mean, we'll talk about who she is and, you know, where, where she comes from, her role as the wife of Zeus, that sort of thing. And also the, the relationship between her and Zeus, that is absolutely critical because most of the stories about her, and, about her, and actually about a large portion of Greek mythology have to do with uh, Zeus's infidelities and how Zeus behaves in the relationship and her response to it. Um, and, and as we'll see, that, there's, there's, that affects so much of what happens in Greek mythology. And what that means about the Greek gods, it, it really, it's a really good setup and test case for looking at the, the ancient gods, the way that we tend to, there's a tendency to look at them socially and ethically, you know, to say, to look at their behavior and talk about how, um, you know, how, how, they, how they should be behaving or how they should be mirrors of human behavior. The reality is, uh, even though there's something definitely very psychological, um, you know, it's, it's a very psychological personification uh, in these gods, um, it's not about, uh, it's not what the, the, the word that they use is didactic. It's not a moral tale telling you how to behave. Um, because Hera definitely does not behave the way that one uh, that one would call um, you know uh, model behavior, okay? Uh, and yet at the same time, she does uh, command model behavior. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about their relationship, which is a which takes up a huge chunk of of Greek mythology. I couldn't give you a percentage, but I almost feel like I could say as much as sixty percent of Greek mythology has something to do with this relationship between. Um, Hera and Zeus, or or Juno and Jupiter. And so, okay, so those narratives, we're going to kind of summarize, talk about a few of them. Uh, and then I'm also going to talk about her role in the Trojan War, <clears throat> which is related to this. But, um, but, you know, but her behavior there is another uh, entire, uh, there's another dynamic to that whole um, saga when it comes to how Hera behaves and, and what it means. And most importantly, I want to talk about her as the goddess Juno in the Roman epic, the Aeneid, written by Virgil. Because Hera's role there um, is, <laughs> uh, she, she does a lot of things that um, are very difficult to, to understand. Um, and I'm going to actually, I'm going to want to frame this conversation by quoting something. There's an article that I had found when I was teaching this in my mythology class years ago by an article by um, Maggie Kilgore, and it was in, let's see, it was uh, uh, ELH, um, which is published by the Johns Hopkins University Press. Um, I'm not exactly sure what um, ELH is short for, what, what that's an acronym for, but, because um, it doesn't actually tell me here. 
but I had, I had downloaded this article called Satan and the Wrath of Juno. Okay. And Maggie Kilgore says, she, she starts her article by talking about um, Paradise Lost by John Milton. And if you're not familiar with Paradise Lost, this is the, um, this is a, a, a long, long form epic poem, I guess we could say, by John Milton um, that was written, I don't actually remember the years of, of Paradise Lost, but we're talking about something that was kind of, you know, around the time of Shakespeare, just post Shakespeare, like kind of that, that time frame, I want to say sometime in the 1600s. And Paradise Lost is about uh, the, the fall of Lucifer, okay? And um, just, to, just to quote a little bit of what she says here. Um, so it says, um, The Son of God, resplendent in the chariot of paternal deity, appears to the angels for the first time on the third day of the war in heaven. Sent to bring an end to the war, the Son does so by dividing the good angels from the bad. However, while he claims that he will distinguish God's saints unmixed and from the impure, it is the angel's own reaction to his appearance that seems to determine definitively which side they're on. While the good angels are with unexpected joy surprised, the bad stood ab abjured and are hardened uh, more by what might most reclaim. Okay, this is the, the Middle English here the, um, that is uh, written, where it's how it's written, and rejects the offer of reclamation. The rebe rebels confirm their envy and rage against the sun. Okay. And uh, when I taught my underworld mythology class uh, on metapsychosis for the first time, um, I remember the students I had there when we were talking about this sort of relationship of, you know, we were talking about Satan and, and the relationship with Satan and how, um, and the way in which, you know, um, Yahweh, I guess, or, or, you know, God and the Son of God act as kind of like these these corporate heads who are who are playing favorites with the people who kiss ass or something. It was, I can't remember exactly how we framed it, but most people agreed that it, it just, there just seems something very unjust about it. Anyway, that's, that's a diversion. What, what's important here is she's talking about this in the way that, um, these, these, um, these certain angels, including Lucifer, you know, rage against the son of God. And here's the, here's the critical sentence. As long noted, the rhetorical question um, okay, no, she starts with, um, so he, they talk about this one particular angel says, a moment of potential conversion slides into a demonstration of devilish perversion. The narrator, Ra Raphael, the archangel, is astonished by this scene of suicidal self-damnation, exclaiming, in heavenly spirits, could such perverseness dwell? Okay, that's the framing question, and as she says here, as long noted, the rhetorical question echoes the famous opening of the Aeneid. Um, Tantene animus celestibus irae. Can anger so fierce dwell in heavenly breasts? Okay. So that's, that's kind of what we're examining here. Can anger so fierce dwell in heavenly breasts? Um, and, the re and the reference here is to Juno, to the goddess Juno. And it's not just in the Aeneid. We, we see this in a lot of different places. So what I want to talk about in this podcast on Hera, or Hera slash Juno, is that <clears throat> we want to talk about the, the kind of role, you know, th this, this, this very fascinating and complex um, image of her. She's queen of the gods. She represents respectable marriage, okay? So kind of the wiles of Aphrodite and, and you know, seduction and lovemaking. That's not her. Lovemaking is your duty as your spouse, right? And she is, um, so she is, she is very much, even though th there, there's references to her having dalliances with Zeus before they were married, um, there's definitely the sense that she is a prim and proper woman um, who follows all of the conventions. And then, of course, when her husband, which unfortunately it was very conventional for, you know, you know, spouses to cheat, um, the, the, the rash of infidelities that Zeus has, you know, her response to that, um, with the wrath and violent anger, but never towards her husband. Okay. So let me start by, um, reading something on Hera from the classical, what is it? Dictionary of Classical Mythology, which was put out by Penguin. Um, <clears throat> okay. The entry for Hera, and there's going to be a lot of information in this one. So, uh, so hang on. 
They said she's the greatest of all the Olympian goddesses, the daughter of Cronus and Rhea, and is hence Zeus's sister. She was swallowed by Cronus, but restored to life by Metis and Zeus. Hera was brought up by Oceanus and Tethys, who we talked about in the last podcast, to whom Rhea had entrusted her during the struggle between Zeus and the Titans. Other traditions credit the Horai, or the Hours, with Hera's upbringing, or Temenus, or the daughters of Asterion. Okay, well, that's um, detail. Hera married Zeus in a formal wedding ceremony. Hesiod says she was Zeus's third wife. The first was Metis, and the next was Themis. Metis being the goddess of wisdom, who he swallowed, and Themis, who is the um, titan of law and order. The love between Zeus and Hera was of long standing, however, and they had coupled secretly on days when Cronus ruled the universe. Uh, four children were born of their marriage. Hephaestus, who was the god of blacksmithing. Uh, Ares, the god of war. Aletheia, who is the goddess of childbirth. And Hebe, who is uh, considered to be, she means youthful, and she's the cupbearer of the gods. One tradition places the site of their wedding at the Garden of the Hesperides. And Hesper comes from Vesper. It has to do with evening or the western skies. So there's sort of a slight underworld connection in, in inference there because the Hesperides are supposed to be in the western lands on the edge of the world by the, by the primal oceans and where Atlas holds up the world. Um, Atlas um, being a titan who was defeated in the war and that became his, his role was to, um, to hold the earth up on his shoulders. Some mythographers assert that the golden apples of the Hesperides were a present given to Hera by Gaia, the earth mother, on the occasion of her marriage and that Hera found them so beautiful she planted them in her garden on the shores of the ocean. So remember, if she was taken care of by Oceanus and Tethys, this is a place she made of state in this evening land, in this, this land that, that borders the underworld. The Iliad says Zeus and Hera were married on the summit of Mount Ida in Phrygia, and there's a lot of connections between Zeus and Mount Ida, so that, that also can, be, um, can make sense. And is another example of how you can have multiple traditions in the same myth. Other traditions place the marriage in Euboea, where the god and goddess landed when they came from Crete. Festivals commemorating the marriage of Zeus and Hera took place almost everywhere in Greece. The statue of the goddess was dressed in the costume of a bride and carried in procession to a shrine where a marital bed had been made already. Hera was, in the, protect was the protecting deity of wives. She is portrayed as jealous, violent, and vindictive, often angry with Zeus, whose infidelities she regarded as insults. She visited her hatred not only on Zeus's mistresses, but on the children he sired among them. Um, among these, Heracles was the greatest victim of Hera's wrath. Now, Heracles, by the way, we think of Hercules, which is the Roman name. Heracles literally means the glory of Heros, Heracleos. Okay? He's, the, he's the glory of Hera, and he was named such to try to actually appease Hera at his birth. Her, her vindictiveness cost her dear, however, for when Heracles returned after he captured Troy in this particular tradition, Hera raised a violent storm against his ship. This displeased Zeus, who hung her from, her from Mount Olympus by her wrists with an anvil fastened to each foot. Hephaestus tried to free his mother, which brought Zeus's wrath on him. He actually got flung out of heaven. That's at least one story for how he became a lame god, how he broke his foot. Um, later, Hera made formal peace with Heracles, and you'll find that she does the same with Aeneas, too. Um doesn't always happen, but it depends on, on how much force Zeus or Jupiter brings to, um, brings to bear on the situation. Hera appears in many myths. She persecuted Io, who was one of Zeus's lovers, and suggested that the Curates that they should kill um, Apaphis, her rival's son. She was responsible for Semele's fate. If you remember that from Dionysus, having Semele burned up by you know, making Zeus uh, show himself to her as he, as he is as a god. She struck Athamas and Aino with madness to punish them for having brought up Dionysus, Zeus's son by Semele. Yeah, and she, by the way, she afflicted Dionysus with madness, too. She urged Artemis to slay Callisto. Callisto being the, um, she was one of the uh, chaste followers of Artemis, who Zeus um, seduced. Actually, he took the form of Artemis, so when she, he called to her, she thought, oh, I have to go to my mistress. And instead, he raped her, and when she got pregnant, um... Yeah, Hera encouraged Artemis to, um, to to turn her into a bear, basically, and then she was supposed to be hunted down by her own son. But Zeus took pity and placed Callisto in the sky with her son, um, <clears throat> Arcus, I believe, with the name. And they are there as Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, the, the great bear and the little bear in the sky. Okay. 
um, and who she tried and she tried to stop the birth of Artemis and Apollo when Leto was in labor. Uh, yeah, Leto was pursued all over the world until she was allowed to um, settle down finally and give birth. And she would delay Aletheia, the goddess of childbirth, to, to go from attending. Hera's anger and her acts of vengeance sometimes had other reasons behind them. Hera and Zeus were arguing one day as to whether the man or woman derived greater pleasure from sex. Zeus said that women enjoyed it more. Hera said that men did. The two deities consulted Tiresias, who had experienced sex as both a man and a woman. Now, Tiresias is the blind prophet. You see him in a lot of places. He's in the Odyssey. Um, he's the one that Odysseus calls back from the dead to prophesy about how he can get home. He appears in the saga of Oedipus. Uh, when Oedipus is trying to find out why there's a plague on his city, they're like, well, there's a murderer here, and Tiresias is trying to find maybe a nice way or not so nice way to say, actually, that murderer is you, because you're the one who killed your father, but he didn't know it. Um... So Tiresias is a very famous blind prophet, and the story was that he had gone into the woods and um, he encountered a snake, and when he touched the snake, or touched it, two snakes uh, copulating, and when he touched them with his staff, he turned into a woman. And he lived as a woman for seven years, and then he returned to the forest and he found the same snakes, touched them again with the staff, and he became a man again. So he had lived life as both a man and a woman. That's why he was consulted. Okay. Uh, Tiresias said that if the pleasures of love were divided into ten parts, the man felt one of those parts, while the woman felt the other nine. Hera was so annoyed, she deprived Tiresias of his sight. And of course it doesn't say here, but Zeus compensated him by giving him the prophecy gift. Hera participated in the beauty contest with Aphrodite and Athena, with Paris acting as judge. Okay, now of course this is considered to be the instigating event of the Trojan War, which is discussed in the Iliad and other sources. Um, <clears throat> what happens, now of course the Iliad doesn't talk about this particular incident, but what happens is that um, there is a wedding feast. It's the wedding feast of uh, Peleus and Thetis. Okay, Peleus is a mortal king, Thetis is a nymph. She happens to be the same nymph that gave birth, um, you know, she, she gives birth to, um, to Achilles, and she had been a lover of Zeus at one time. But <clears throat> she ends up being married to this mortal man, mainly because Zeus was afraid, um, you know, of, of her child overthrowing him if he, if he mated with her. So she ends up rejecting Zeus, but then Achilles is born of that union. Now, at that wedding feast, um, uh, Eris, the goddess of chaos, is, of course, not invited. So Eris, feeling annoyed, takes a golden apple and throws it into the company with the inscribed on it, to the fairest. So, of course, immediately Aphrodite, Athena, and Hera all go to claim the apple. And since there's an argument over it, they get Paris, who is the prince of Troy, one of the princes of Troy, to come and judge who is the most, who is the loveliest of the goddesses. And that is a terrible position to be in, because you know that no matter what choice you make, you're going to be screwed some other way. So, ultimately, how do they try to win? Well, they bribe him. Hera offers to make him a great king. Um, Athena offers to give him great prowess in war, and Aphrodite offers him the most beautiful woman in the world, Helen. Helen, currently Helen of Sparta, who's married to King Menelaus, and whom actually, when there were many suitors for Helen, they all were swore, the, you know, once when she chose her husband, which was Menelaus, they all swore to uphold, you know, you know, to, to fight to uphold that, that decision. So Paris being Paris, because he is uh, sometimes known as Alexandros, Paris is somebody who, um, he's more of a lover than a fighter. So yeah, he says, oh yeah, I want the most beautiful woman. So, um, so he gives the apple to Aphrodite, um, which Athena seems to take with some good grace, but Hera does not, because that's how Hera is. So, um, and Hera, and Paris's abduction of Helen, um, now Menelaus, you know, okay, um, He's, he's had, had Paris into his house as a guest, as a hospitable guest, okay? And that's considered a violation of hospitality, running off with his wife. And Paris doesn't make, you know, reparations, although later on he offers to um, give back anything that he had taken with him, but he wanted to keep Helen, and this was not an acceptable uh, response. And all the Greek warriors are going to fight this battle because many of them had, had vied for her hand and had vowed that they would uphold his... Uh, his right to be her husband. So this is why they're all there. Um, so going on with what this says, when Hera raised, Paris abducted Helen, Hera raised a storm which drove them onto the Syrian coast. 
Hera became Achilles' protectress since she had brought Thetis up. And this is the reason why Thetis spurned the advances of Zeus. Nonetheless, as you see in the beginning of the Iliad, there is a little bit of a quarrel when she sees Zeus talking to Thetis. It's like, what are you guys talking about? You know, that like kind of a thing that goes on. And there's a back and forth. When Thetis, um, when Achilles is insulted by Agamemnon and Thetis asks for some kind of reparation on his behalf, and Zeus, of course, is annoyed by this because he says, well, you know it's going to annoy Hera. But what he does is he says, I'm not going to let the Achaeans, which is the, the League of um, Tribal Kings in the area we now think of as Greece, so some people think of them as the Greek side, um, I'm not going to let them win against the Trojans until um, sufficient reparation has been paid to Achilles. Okay, And Achilles refused to join the battle at that point. So... Um, <clears throat> Uh, later, Hera extended her protection to Menelaus and gave him immortality. Okay, so Menelaus, yeah, she, she's she's very staunchly um, on whoever opposed Troy, on the side of whoever opposed Troy. Uh, Hera participated in the war against the giants, in which she was attacked by Porphyrion, and they said later on she was attacked by Ixion, who wished to abduct her. Another version of that says he didn't attack her, that Zeus knew that Ixion um, lusted after Hera, so he created like an image of her in a cloud, and when Ixion went to go grab it, her, you know, of course it disappeared because, you know, it was, it was an illusion created by Zeus. But the very fact that he wanted to try to ravish the queen of the gods, um, he ended up chained to a fiery wheel in Tartarus. So, um, yeah, wasn't wasn't a very wise move. And it's interesting because... Yeah, it's kind of like it's okay for Zeus to go to to um you know, to kind of philander, but if, if anything happens with Hera, if any man pursues Hera, that that's just completely not acceptable. And we'll talk a little about that. Um Hera was the protectress of the Argo, which is from the Argonautica, the Jason and the Golden Fleece story, which she helped to pass unscathed between the plank die or the wandering rocks and the narrows of Scylla and Charybdis. Um, you know, not to get into detail on those, but uh, they're basically personifications of, um, you know, these certain nautical, um, you know, possible dangers um, of, of um, the, that part of the sea down to, uh, you know, the, the south of uh, the Greek, sort of in that, that, that area there between the Greek, um, you know, between Greece and then northern Africa and, you know, those, that whole area there, there's a... There are a number of places and straits that are not um, that are very dangerous to pass through. Um, Hera's usual symbol was the peacock, whose plumage was said to represent the eyes of Argus, whom the goddess had set over Io. Okay, um, yeah. If you look at a peacock, its feathers seem to have like hundreds of eyes, you know, on on their uh, plumage. And the idea was that Zeus had changed Io into a cow. And, um, you know, you know, but, but, you know, so she, she had set this, um, set Argos with his hundred eyes over to watch her to make sure that, um, you know, she remained as a cow and that she wasn't like secretly changed back or anything. So she was kind of stuck in that form. Um, in Rome, Hera was identified with Juno. Okay. So that's from the dictionary of classical myth. Um, now with respect to, okay. So we've mentioned some of the stories there of infidelity. And interesting, an interesting thing is when I look at the major deities, I was looking back at a lecture I had done on the major deities of the 12 Olympians. And um, we talk about the children of Zeus and Hera, who are, you know, Hebe, again, who is youthful bloom, uh, Hephaestus, who is the craftsmith, so he's making weaponry and jewelry and things like that, Ayers, who's a god of war, and Aletheia, a god of childbirth. So it's interesting that they all seem to represent... Um, certain qualities or certain certain things um, that, that, that don't all entirely seem to go together. Um, and I feel like in some way there's, there's certain aspects of their children that reflect the qualities of the parents. For example, Ayers as the god of war, really, um, Zeus and Hera are, you know, they're at war a lot of the time. Um, and um, Hephaestus, who is considered to be sort of ugly and imperfect, um, <clears throat> you know, may kind of, uh, and, and actually originally Hera had flung him out of the heavens because she thought he was too ugly. And, but then when she, he was picked up, of course, as a babe and, and raised on an island and you could see that she saw that he was able to make these beautiful things. She says, who's making these beautiful things? When she finds out it's her son, then he's allowed back on Mount Olympus. So very interesting. The son who, um, unlike what we saw with Keridwin, where, um, her son was born in what was considered to be ugly, but she actually went to bat trying to find 
some kind of special skill or something to make him accepted. Hera's attitude is, I'm not going to accept you until you do something that I think is, is useful to me. And um, he serves like a sort of um, subservient role, which is a quality of, which was considered to be a quality of marriage. You know, the, the wife submitted to the husband. And Alethea as childbirth, yes, childbirth is another duty of proper marriage. Um, and again, I'm just saying proper, traditional, heteronormative marriage. We're not talking about, um, you know, other things at this point. Um, but we also see that Zeus and Leto produced Artemis and Apollo. Zeus with Semele produced Dionysus, or in some versions, Persephone. Um, Zeus and Metis produced Athena. Zeus and Maya, the nymph, produced Hermaeus. Maya has a distinction of probably being the only... Um, uh, only lover of Zeus that Hera never went after. And it could be that because she hid in a cave most of the time and never came out. But, um, but Hermaeus is, is the child is their child. And Zeus has had countless other affairs. Um, Zeus and Danae, for example, were the parents of, uh, he appears to Danae, who's locked away in a tower. She's the daughter of King Acrisius of Argus. And she is, you know, he's trying to keep his daughter virginal. And Zeus visits her as a shower of gold and ravishes her. And Perseus is born, the, the hero who slays Medusa. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of, and a lot of the heroes are claimed to have Zeus's lineage. Now, from a very practical political standpoint, you know, there, the, some of these stories, there, there was a suggestion, I think even Herodotus suggested this, um, he who wrote uh, the Greek histories, pretty much contemporary back in that time. Uh, or, or, or close to it. He was certainly writing within the same era as, at the very least, you know, maybe Plato, maybe a little bit before that. Um, but Herodotus had even said that, you know, there was, there was probably a lot of kings who claimed to be a son of Zeus because it, you know, because it, it just sort of, um, you know, it, it, it highlighted why they should be king, you know, why, why they were the best choice for king because they were obviously, um, you know, as a demigod themselves, obviously their royal lineage, you know, that, that made them, um, you know, stand, stand out above the others. This made them more qualified than the others. So, um, so yeah, but, but you have this situation where Juno repeatedly attacks um, over and over again these children of Zeus. There is one other episode that's not mentioned here, and that's the episode of Zeus and Ganymede. And I think I have mentioned this in another episode, but Ganymede, of course, is a male. He is the son of Tross, and the name Troy actually comes from Tross. Um, the Iliad is actually, um, there's another name for Troy, and that's Ilium, okay? And Ilium is one of the sons, uh, or Ilias, actually, is one of the sons of Tross, okay? He's actually a brother to Ganymede, and... Um, and that's why it's called the Iliad, because it has to do with Troy. That's, that's where the name comes from, is Ilias, which is the other name, or Ilium, which is another name given to Troy. But, uh, so Tross is kind of the progenitor of this, of this royal line. And Zeus sees Ganymede and thinks he is an absolutely beautiful young man, so he turns himself to an eagle and carries Ganymede off and brings him to Mount Olympus. Now, he's, he himself is a water bearer or cup bearer on Mount Olympus, like Hebe, um, but he's also, there's an implication there that he is also a lover of Zeus. And Ganymede is the prototype for the constellation and the, and the zodiac sign of Aquarius, okay? Because he is the water bearer. He is the one who, you know, bears, you know, presuming it's water, we call it water, he could be bearing something else, but he's a cup bearer, okay? He carries the vessel around to the gods. So, uh, yeah, so Ganymede is the model for the Aquar of Aquarius. And this particular relationship, this, you know, what, what would have been, been a, you know, and, and homosexual relationships were very, very common. But this is, this is one of the ones, um, and you see that Poseidon has them. I mean, it's not, um, it's not that uncommon in Greek mythology, though you tend to hear more about the others. Um, and I think it's the fact that Ganymede is a son of trust. This is another reason for Hera to hate Troy. And her hatred of Troy, boy, does it, I mean, she never lets it go. It's, it goes through the Trojan War, even after the Trojans lose. Um, they have their hero, uh, Aeneas, who is the daughter, uh, the, the son of, uh, excuse me, um, of Aphrodite and a mortal man, Anchises. And he is a great hero. And of course, Aphrodite is very protective of him 
and, and Aeneas's nature very much reflects the fact that Aphrodite is his mother. He's, he tends to be, even though he's a warrior, he's, gen, he's more gentle, he's, more, he's definitely very much into religious observance, he's more pious, he pays attention to signs and omens, like he's definitely more um, intuitively in tuned, which would make him more on the quote-unquote having the qualities of the feminine, even though he is uh, considered to be a great warrior. But and Hera and then Juno, of course, in, in Virgil's epic, hates his hates his guts, absolutely hates him. Um, so and of course she wouldn't rest until Troy was burned to the ground. So, um, so that that sort of brings us to the. Um, uh, her role in the Trojan War. Okay, so as we mentioned in the beginning of the Iliad, there's this, this fight between Achilles and Agamemnon over a woman, over a concubine, you know, a woman that they had captured as part of their spoils. And the father of this girl, um, Briseis, had come to ransom her. He was a priest of Apollo. And he brought a ransom to Agamemnon to take his daughter home. Agamemnon refused. So he, so Briseis, um, the father prayed to Apollo, and Apollo, as he always does, because he is a god of plagues, among everything else, sends a plague onto the, the troops. And so there's a quarrel between Achilles and Agamemnon, because Achilles says, you really should return this girl. I'm sorry, it's not Briseis, it's Creseus. I'm, I'm getting them mixed up. Um, Creseus is, is the woman. And so finally, Agamemnon agrees just to relieve the plague, but then he says, well, I'm going to take your concubine, Briseis, instead. And this is a great insult to Achilles. So in other words, you know, they, they see the women here as the spoils of war. And let's put the social and ethical thing aside for now, because a lot of people will say, that's terrible that they're treating women that way. Yeah, it is. But that's not really the point here. So I kind of want to put that to the side. Um, and so then Briseis ends up becoming the concubine of, um, of Agamemnon, sensibly. So, and the way, um, there's a book called Achilles in Vietnam, which compares the, which talks about the experience of Vietnam vets with respect to the Trojan War. And the author talks about how um, that taking of Briseis, it's a little bit like if you were in the military and you served and, and, you know, you were given, say, a Congressional Medal of Honor, and then your general came and said, I want that, and took it away. Um, it's the same kind of uh, insult. And it, and it basically indicates that, you know, whoever's considered to be the commanding officers there um, are not showing respect, you know, for the men. And so there, there's a rage that takes place. And so Achilles says, fine, I'm not fighting anymore. And he asks his mother, the nymph Thetis, to approach Zeus, and she, which she does. And Zeus, as I mentioned earlier, he's like, oh, you know, now you're going to get Hera on, you know, because he knows Hera hates Troy. Okay. Um, but he agrees that the Greeks will not win until appropriate um, reparations have been paid to Achilles, because apparently he also thinks this is um, not cool. So, you know, the first part of it is the Greeks fighting against the Trojan, Trojans and losing badly. I mean, they have, they have a few little victories here and there, but it's usually Hera and Athena plotting to move them ahead, like against Zeus's wishes. So she goes against her husband's wishes. And one of the, the big events, is speaking of Mount Ida, is what they call the deception of Zeus, or the Ate. What, what she does is she asks Aphrodite to borrow her girdle and so forth, and she takes Zeus to Mount Ida and says, oh, let us take a break, and you know, and she basically seduces him and, and makes love to him. But she has the god uh, Hypnos, the god of sleep, um, put him to sleep, because Zeus never sleeps. And Hypnos is like, uh, the last time I put Zeus to sleep, I got in so much trouble. She's like, no, don't worry about it. I, I, I've got this. And she offers Hypnos this beautiful nymph as a wife, and so he's, you know, well, okay then, you know. And, of course, Zeus goes to sleep, and Hera goes down, and she wreaks havoc. You know, she she, man she allows the Achaeans to wreak havoc on the Trojans. And when Zeus wakes up, he is pissed. He knows what she's done, and she he is pissed. And he basically kind of says to her, don't you ever do that to me again. Um, that was it. She, she wasn't, she wasn't, and that's the thing. She wasn't like she really wanted a romantic moment with her husband. She was using her feminine charms to, um, to deceive him and to get her way. Okay. Something to think about now. So then, um, yeah. And, and, and throughout the whole thing, she is supporting the Greeks. Like, absolutely. When Achilles finally comes into the battle and he's being uh, thwarted by the river god who tries to drown him, she sends Hephaestus to set the, the thing on fire. That's what I've only said. That would have made a really great movie. I don't know why they didn't make a movie about it. You know, river choked with corpses and, like, you know, everything's on fire. You know, it, it would have been, like, 
until the river finally is like, okay, I yield, but the damn fire's out, you know? Um, so it's just really a, uh, yeah, it, it's quite a scene there. And, and, and of course the fire and the water and the way that they, you know, conflict there, there there's definitely a, a symbolism there about, about Achilles wrath at that point. But, um, so yeah, so Hera, Hera pursues throughout this whole saga. Now, the other place where Hera, um, again, where, as Juno, because this is now, in, uh, we're talking the Roman epics and where a lot of the Greek gods were transferred, you know, more or less, there, there's some, some, some of them that are not, they, they're not a one-to-one -one match, uh, Mars being a good example, um, because Ares is a god of war, and they say, oh, well, the Roman equivalent is Mars, but Mars is also kind of a god of agriculture and stuff, so yeah, it's not quite always a one-to-one -one match. Uh, Saturn and Kronos are not always a one-to-one -one match, you know. Anyway, so you you get the idea, but it's um, so Aeneas. Okay, after the Trojan War, now remember he's somebody who um, is very faithful, very pious, very um, makes his abulations to the god. His mother does turn up to try to help him along the way, because Venus is considered to be the mother of the Roman people. Okay, because she's Venus there, not Aphrodite, and. You know, so but you know, so she she appears and, and disappears at different times. But he he goes to the oracles. He he listens to what he feels the gods are doing or what they want, and he is sailing off to Italy because he knows he has been told it is his destiny that he is going to found a city. Um, which, by the way, happens to most of the heroes. They all go to Italy and they found cities. If I mean, unless they do something really stupid and then get killed by the gods for being idiots. But other than that, most of them. You know, they, they, you read about them, and, and there's kind of this pattern of, and they went to this city in Italy, and they founded it, and they had their cult, and they were worshipped as a hero when they died. You know what I mean? There became this worship, this hero cult, um, and that was, and that's really a sign of how they gain their immortality through their deeds. You know, they become as though they are divine. So, okay, so what happens in the Aeneid? So Aeneas is just minding his own business with his crew, you know, on his way, and then Hera sends up a great storm. Okay, to try to uh, shipwreck them, and they do end up ship. They do end up um, having to, to beach for a period of time at Carthage. Okay, which is in North Africa, and it, 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 if you know anything about Roman history, you remember the idea of um, the Punic Wars, and at least um, one, at least a couple of those were between Carthage and Rome because they were both kind of getting to be superpowers in that region at the time. And so what it is is he comes off the boat and Queen um, Queen Dido is there and she falls in love with him. And Hera tries to make it, tries to arrange like, oh, you know, she, she's trying to like barter with that with Venus, who of course is his mother, uh, about how, oh, you know, yeah, he, he should stay and he should marry. And it's interesting because Juno was actually uh, very supportive of Carthage. But see, if he had stayed in Carthage, then Rome never would have been built and never would have become a great city. See, Rome didn't exist at this point. So... Um, so instead, um, Mercury, who is the, it was Hermaeus, um, Hermaeus in, in the, in the, uh, Greek, he's in the Roman, he's Mercury, comes to, uh, Aeneas, who is, you know, at this point, you know, walking, helping with building projects and stuff. It's like, he's gonna, and he supposedly he's had a secret wedding to, to Queen Dido. Um, but then she appears and he's like, what are you doing here? Like, get out of here. Like, get, get on your boat and move on. You got, you got stuff to do. So he's like, oh, okay. So he goes. And then, of course, there's the wrath of Dido as well, and, um, you know, and, and, and her anger, and she ends up committing suicide, is what she does. But Aeneas goes on, and he, um, and he's beset by all of these troubles along the way. I mean, he stops, he listens to dreams, he talks to the river gods, all these things happen, and he's going to a town called um, Latium. Uh, which is uh, a queen, um, which is a, sorry, is a, it's a, it's a town in, um, in Italy. And this is the town that he sort of guided towards is the one that, you know, that's going to be, he eventually founds a city called Alba Longa, which is not very far from that. Um, but um, <clears throat> the, I think, I think the, um, what's her name? Lavinium, I think is her name. She's the, the princess. And when he arrives in the city, the king says, oh, there was a prophecy about this foreigner who was going to come. And, you know, so, of course, he's very willing to marry Lavinium to Aeneas. But no. Um, Hera is going to intervene. She's already engaged to a man named Turnus. Now, initially, Turnus is like, okay, well, you know, if they're going to, you know, he, he's not going to make a big deal about it. But then Tur um, Hera, or Juno, rather, sends the Furies, okay, the Arrhenius, 
who play quite a role in this, they send snakes to go wi wind their way into his heart and inflame him with anger and, and the desire for war. So the war in the Aeneid, there's a totally unnecessary war that's happened. And you see throughout the whole tone of it, it's a very different tone from the Iliad, even though it's trying to be an epic kind of like the Iliad for Romans, there's definitely a sense of war is a waste of young life. And it's unnecessary. And, um, you know, where there could have been peace and love, instead, there's this bloodshed because, you know, uh, Juno sent the Furies. Um, and, you know, so, okay, this war happens, there's a lot of death and bloodshed, and eventually, at the very end of the Aeneid, um, you know, uh, Aeneas kills Turnus. Um, he, he actually, and, and Turnus begs for mercy, and normally Aeneas's nature would be, uh, to spare him, but he saw that he was wearing the friend, uh, the belt of his friend who he had murdered, uh, because Turnus had murdered Aeneas's best friend, um, but just like Patroclus, uh, who was Achilles' best, you know, best friend in, in the army, was murdered or was killed, and his body was left out. You know, there was a fight over his body. When he found out Patroclus was killed, then that's when he got back involved in the war. And similarly, um, in this case, uh, Aeneas' friend, and I want to say I think his name is Pallas. Um, he is, he is, he is enraged to see the belt on Turnus that he had taken, you know, stripped from the body of his dead friend, and so he kills Turnus you know, in an act in, you know, which, which might not be totally out of character because it's a very emotional act. Okay. Um, and that's how the Aeneid ends. Um, Virgil actually never really wanted the Aeneid published. That's kind of a side note there, but he had said in his will that he had wanted it destroyed. Um, and, and you have to remember too, the Aeneid was written at a time when, um, they were in the, what they were heading towards what they called the Pax Romana. It was the, the beginning of the Roman Empire, uh, Augustus was emperor, and Augustus really liked Virgil. He was like the poet laureate. Um, and so in a way, it's almost like this particular narrative was written to glorify Augustus and his family. Because there's a lot of reference to the Iulius clan, which is Julius, which is where Julius Caesar comes from. Julius Caesar, you know, Augustus is part of that, that family. And, um, you know, so there's, there's a lot about, you know, there's, there's all the scenes, you know, Aeneas vends the underworld and all this stuff. You know, I'm not here to talk about the Aeneid exclusively. But the question becomes, you know, so, and then in the end, okay, an, uh, Jupiter or Jove finally says to his wife, okay, knock it off. Um, you know, this is, and the thing is, it's destiny. One of the things about the Greek gods is that they cannot override the fates, if the fates have decreed that this is what this person's doing with their life, the gods can't change that. Um, and Hera knows, I'm sorry, Juno, she knows this. Okay? But she still intends to, you know, diddle around and, and get, you know, and make a problem. And so the question is why? Like, is your hatred of Troy that bad? Like, why the, why the heck can't you just let it go? And... um in Kilgore's article, just going back to that for a moment, she says, um, these questions concerning the presence of destructive emotions in spiritual beings, again, comparing it to um, uh, the Lucifer and the fallen angels, have deeply disturbing implications for our understanding of the nature of the divine and the origin of evil. Specifically, John Milton's allusion to Virgil suggests that the role the furious Juno plays in the Aeneid will be played by the perverse Satan. Some parallels between the two are obvious. Like Virgil's Juno, Satan both sets the plot in motion and then tries to delay its inevitable ordained end. They're both associated with confusion, transgression, and boundary breaking. And Satan is a bounder, bounder in every sense. They thus oppose the figures of Job and Jesus, um, who are both connected with order, closure, and the setting of limits through discrimination and difference. So this makes Juno kind of a kind of a trickster figure. And the fact that she also assigns madness to people, um, that that's one of her attributes, that she can drive people mad. Um, this this suggests to me that she is not that, you know, there's there's a lot more going on here. You're not talking about um, the fact that she can behave in this way. That's it. Why, how, how can that kind of feeling, you know, exist? in a being who is supposed to represent, you know, civilized, respectful, decency, and law and order. Well, from a social perspective, it's probably not that hard to figure out. Um, because, as we know, most of these kind of traditional social institutions, um, they're not about feelings, they're not about authenticity, they're not about freedom. Marriage is one of those institutions that is very, very limiting. Um, 
Mark Morford, who wrote, who's written the classical mythology textbooks, which if some of you took courses like that, you might be familiar with it. He talks about, um, what's the phrase that he uses? He uses the phrase, um, um, what is it? Uh, desire, it has to do with desiring that which is forbidden. Okay. And there's a theme there of, of desiring that which is forbidden, which is why Zeus is continually trying to, um, you know, is, is never satisfied by just having Hera. I mean, because really she's just very cold. You know, she's just, she's there. She's his wife. It's her marital duty to, um, you know, to give him what he wants or whatever. But at the same time in her, you know, she, she's, same time she has some authority, but everything is in relationship to her husband. She exists in relation to her husband. And what I, what I find fascinating about the myth of Hera is that it, she really kind of ends up being an archetype of what marriage is like. And real marriage, not the fairy tale Cinderella, Prince Charming comes and it's happily ever after. But marriage is a give and take. There's already a limitation that's put on. Uh, there's an enforced chastity. That's the other phrase Morford uses. I couldn't think of it. Enforced chastity and desiring what's forbidden. This idea of monogamy, that you, you have married each other and now it's to the exclusion of others. And um, psychologically, unless you happen to have made exactly the right kind of soul partnership, that rarely works out, you know, <laughs> rarely works as intended. There's often times where infidelity occurs, or there's times when people are married and one of the partners is thinking about somebody else or whatever. That's, that's not, um, you know, a lot of times women get married and now think like, oh, okay, like, like they've snared him, like he's the only one. That's why they have the, all the ideas about, oh, the old ball and chain and, and, and so forth. You know, you're going to rein him in and, you know, um, you know, keep him from, you know, like sowing his wild oats as though that's the thing that the man's supposed to do is just to go out and, and be this big player while the woman, you know, it's her job to really be the obedient one. And, um... There could be some biological basis for this. They say that the sexual center in men is in the genitals in what they would call the lower muladhara chakra, whereas for women, uh, where the uterus is, is one above that in the svadhisthana chakra, um, or the, you know, um, the sacrum, as they call it. And those two centers, um, you know, again, this is more esoteric thinking, but the idea is that one has to do with survival and biology and natural and urges, Whereas the other may have more to do with um, settling down and nesting and having a family. So that's why there tends to be this. Now, I don't, I don't want to make that as a generalization about human biology. That's just one sort of theorizing, you know, like, you know, the u uterus versus the penis. Like, they're not, um, there tends to be a drive towards different things. One is towards, you know, and not necessarily procreation either. I should make that clear. Not necessarily procreation. But there's that need to satisfy the urge. <clears throat> One that's not necessarily there in the same way in women. Like for women, a lot of times it's more, they want to be loved. And frequently in relationships, unfortunately, that, that doesn't really happen that way. Um, you know, not in the way, mainly because men are not, uh, well, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say mainly, but men are not um, conditioned to deal with emotions. And therefore, when, um, unless it's in that kind of physical expression, sometimes trying to express themselves in other ways, unless, you know, they've been raised differently or, or have been able to be taught that way, a lot of times it's, you know, boys don't cry, um, you have to man up, and, you know, there's this idea, you know, stiff upper lip, that, that men are not supposed to be emotional. And so, therefore, when there's a situation where they may need to deal with feelings or express emotions, either it comes out in a very violent and angry way, or they just become frustrated and withdraw. You know, men, men are not given the tools that they need to express. Whereas for women, they express um, whether it's natural or whether it's, again, environmental conditioning because women, um, you know, there's almost a social expectation about expressing emotions. Although expressing emotions is still kind of a, you know, it's kind of a weak thing to do is the way that they look at it. You know, kind of like if you go someplace, you know, if you're, you're upset, you're not supposed to show it because, you know, that just makes people upset and you shouldn't, yeah, shouldn't do anything to rock the boat. Okay. So, so this is interesting in the figure of Hera because here she is, she's the queen of the gods. She does have to maintain a certain kind of facade, but we still see that her anger comes out and it actually comes out in an almost, um, I'm not going to say exactly in a masculine way, but that's, that's what motivates her actions 
is this anger that she has. She reminds me in a way of the Matrika um, uh, in, in, in Drani. You know, she's, you know, there's that, that, that quality driven by that quality of envy. Um, I wanted to read this one piece, um, and, I, and I'm probably going to end shortly thereafter this because this, this is a subject we could talk about for a very long time. But Jean Shinoda Bolin, who is a Jungian analyst, um, had, had a site where she had written about um, sort of the, you know, looking at it from the Jungian perspective, the, the qualities of these different uh, deities. And she talks about Hera, and she says, well, she's one of the vulnerable goddesses, okay? So her actions are actually a sign of vulnerability um, in the way that when you're vulnerable, you put up walls to, um, to protect yourself. It says she was or is relationship-oriented, dependent upon a significant one, has a need for affiliation, tends to experience powerlessness in the way her husband's acting, and responds with rage and jealousy, accepting diffuse awareness. Fundamentally incomplete without a marriage partner, Hera yearned to be a wife, stately, regal, like as they say, a Nancy Reagan type, beautiful, honored, humiliated, within the capacity, with the capacity to bond, loyal, faithful, enduring, committed, predisposed to displace blame from her mate, on whom she was emotionally dependent, onto others. Vindictive, a mental sleight of hand which made her feel powerful rather than rejected, derived emotional security from a high-status male, work was secondary, placed minimal importance on female friends, her husband's primary friend, preferred a man who was emotionally dependent on her, saw sex as a duty, could oppress other women, could be destructive and judgmental of other women, and really hated Aphrodite types. Her style of limiting herself to being a wife results in limiting her growth and ability to adapt if death or divorce brings her wife role to an end. She is only half of a whole, fulfilling a culturally determined role. Yeah, and that's generally what the traditional attitude towards marriage, that's the problem with it. Um, women are cut off and they're restricted. It's assumed that women are fulfilled by a particular role. First of all, that women are only fulfilled if they are in relationship to another. And in this traditional setting, also, if, they're, if they, they have to be a wife and a mother. Like, even, even Joseph Campbell would say things like, well, that's how women, you know, achieve their fulfillment. And that's BS. It really is. And what I, what I really like about what the Hera myth demonstrates is that, you know, what the consequences are of standing there, you know, uh, respectfully upholding, upholding that image. You uphold a certain image, but the reality is very, very different. There's a lot of rage. There's a lot of sense of rejection. Um, and it's, it, it has no, no limits. And I mean, and, and she will project that rage on other people. Um, and you also see this, it, it's a psychological quality when you see when you have groups of women who work together. If you have women who are in different situations of feeling powerful or power, powerless, if they are in a situation where they have some control, sometimes having the woman in charge is a bad thing because, um, if you have a group of women, they can become clicky and they can become judgmental and, um, you know, and really kind of, you know, very backstabbing kind of things can happen in offices full of women. Um, and I'm not saying this, I don't want to over, again, I don't want to overgeneralize, but I've, I've encountered this enough in my lifetime to know that this is something that happens and I'm hardly the only one. Um, this, this is a possibility and this, this represents that psychological possibility, the ways in which we project and act out when we are dependent or limited. Um, which to me makes the case for why women should be free. And some people, um, I was having a conversation today about, you know, when, when you are a single woman and you live by yourself, people look at you either with pity, like, oh, she doesn't have somebody, or they look at you the other way, like with jealousy, like, oh, or they think you have infinite amount, infinite amounts of time because, um, oh, well, you're home and you're single, so you mustn't be doing anything. And it's like, yeah, not necessarily. I mean, I've, I've lived by myself for like 20 years now. And actually, um, I, it's hard for me to imagine living with somebody. I'm not saying it might never happen again, but I, I can't imagine. Um, it's hard for me to, to imagine that because I'm very comfortable being by myself. But there's a lot of women I've known who are like, oh, I can't even go to the store by myself. Well, I kind of go, well, why? But, but there's, there's, a, there's a thing. It all depends on how, um, how, you're, how, you're in, going, um, how you're interacting with that narrative. Are you kind of being driven by it, or is your are your actions being driven in rebellion against it? And what's interesting here is Hera's kind of doing both. She's going along with the narrative, but she's also rebelling at the same time. It's the only way in which she can get back at her husband is to cause this kind of agony. But she can't cause it to him, 
She has to cause it to the people around her. And that's kind of, there's a kind of profound psychological message there about the way people interact with each other, the way they project their problems onto each other, the way that people seem to feel that, um, you know, it's this person or that person's responsibility either to support or take care of them or deal with their emotional needs, you know, that kind of agenda that can appear in relationships instead of just authentically owning who you are and what your stuff is, both what people consider positive or negative. And also about, you know, whether or not society gets to dictate who you are. And again, I'm not talking about this in an ethical sense. I'm talking about this more in the sense of the way in which um, social norms can potentially be limiting, but the way in which they seem to be something, not, I don't want to say fundamental to human psychology exactly, but they're definitely something, it's a narrative that's ingrained in us enough that there's conflict caused when we, when we try to move away from it or around it. So something to think about. Uh, that's it for me this week. I'm going to stop here. Um, uh, please visit Cathonia.net for my podcasts, other work. Um, I should have another website uh, coming up soon, and I will, will announce that on social media. Um, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Cathonia Podcast, two words on Facebook, one word on Instagram and on Twitter. And also, I'm just Cathonia on YouTube. Um, I want to thank you all for listening. Oh, I've also got patreon.com slash Cathonia. So if you'd like to become a patron, um, please check it out. We'd love, love to have you in the group. I'd appreciate that. That would be that would be awesome. And I want to say a big thank you to the people who are my patrons, both the newer ones and the ones who have been around for a while. That's it for me this week. See you next time. <laughs>